sun's warm. Spring has sprung, the grass is riz. We're in the world of Bigfoots is, right? All right, now, uh, this honorable man emailed me a while back before that first book came out and, he, and, his, and his first encounter was written in the book. He mentions it in the email here. And he emailed me like, last week and he said that he had emailed me again months back and he's had some ongoing problems on his property. And then uh, they've had things basically just terrorizing on the property. So he's, I'm gonna, I found the second email. I got it in here on the phone today. There's no service right here. And he has a photograph that he wants all of you to see. And this photograph was through the window of his house. Tell me how much of a monkey this thing is, right? This being. So I'll start the sequence exactly how it came into me and word for word as usual, all right? Hello, Steve. Bigfoot face photo attached. I appreciate your passion for the truth and the common people. You have my full respect to every ounce of it. And that respect is shared right back at you, sir. Thank you for that. You included my experience with Bigfoot in your first book. It was a late night, and he stood next to my porch. As I walked out onto the porch to scold my dogs for barking, he turned and vanished through a portal a few steps later, and it changed my life. And many, and many other lives, man. Many other lives. I live in Toronto Lake in Kansas. We're heavily wooded and have large hills here with great deer and turkey hunting. I wrote you a second email six months ago about the escalation of Bigfoot experiences that included a footprint, a house slap, a roar in the daytime about a mile away, two encounters in the daytime just feet away with the creature snorting at me like a horse, but I couldn't see anything. And I included how my granddaughter, four years old, could see several giant Bigfoot. She knew nothing about the subject. Just 100 feet away in our woods staring at us but her grandma and I couldn't see anything. You haven't shared that it as of yet, and that's okay. I really am just writing to you, not your audience. It's up to you if you want to share my encounters and this photograph. Either way is fine with me. Your role for me seems more like a priest at confession, LOL. <laughs> it's simply just gotten out of control for us here. It's the last autumn I had that ominous feeling like something is looking at me. I was inside my small house, and it was around 10 p.m. I have to admit... I couldn't force myself to go outside, fearing that I would have another face-to-face -face encounter with it, as I described in my first email that you put in your book. So, I decided to take photos through the open windows. When the camera flashed, I saw something, but I thought it was a tree just outside the window. I took several others at other windows in the house. A few minutes later, I sat down to review the eight photographs on this camera, and what I attached was from the first window in the dining room. I promise this is a real and an undoctored photo the only thing my daughter did for me was lighten it on Photoshop to make it more visible. This window was only four feet off the ground, so he was on his knees looking in the house. The next day I expected to see footprints or a knee indent indention, but there was nothing. We're currently building a new home 100 miles from here on my daughter's farm to be closer to her grandchildren, since they refused to bring the children out here due to all the paranormal Bigfoot UFO crap we're experiencing. Our small five-acre property goes up for sale next month. It breaks my heart to leave. We love it here. Life never goes as you expect, but being run off our beloved homestead by Bigfoot is the last thing I would have guessed five years ago. I pray they don't follow us to our new home. Thank you for hearing my story, John. And there's the photo. John, thank you very much for, for sharing. Thank you absolutely very much for sharing this with us. Okay, man? And I, and for all you who are curious, I spoke with John a couple emails after he sent me this, and uh, he wants me to share this in the photograph with you, and he also wants me to squeeze it in book two, and I think we can probably do that. And that will be going into print again, so that uh, it'll lay on coffee tables around the world, and everybody gets to read the true honest facts of what's going on with a lot of people, okay? So after I read that email and he gave me this photo if you look at that photo um, not really quite a monkey is it right it's not quite a gorilla is it make of it what you will take from it what you will it's up to you 
It's your puzzle that you're finding the pieces to here, okay? It's your puzzle. We all have our own puzzle through life. We're trying to figure out every single piece and nobody has to be doing the same puzzle or agreeing with the same puzzle. That's something everybody's got to understand here. You take from all this what you need or leave it. End of story. It's too easy, okay? Nobody has to control the narrative. Nobody has to. If somebody needs you to believe or look at things the way they do, they got a fierce problem going on between their ears. All right? And there is so many of those individuals out there in Bigfoot Sasquatch community world, it's mind-boggling. It's like, all right, I'll stop right there. So anyways, uh, so I told John, you know, I didn't get the second email, so I told him I'd do a search on his name in my email, and I found it. And here's the second email they sent me. I haven't read it yet, so let's read it together. Here we go. Hello, Steve. I sure appreciate what you do and how you do it. I wrote to you many months ago about my close encounter with Sasquatch in southeast Kansas. You added my story on page 122 of your book. Now, what I want to share with you is the things that have happened since because it is getting worse by the month. I also would like to hear from your viewers to see if they have some answers because I don't. First, I have trouble getting my first encounter out of my mind as I think about it a dozen times a day. Anyway, I've had a dozen experiences on my property since my first face-to-face encounter when it turned and walked four steps and disappeared into thin air. Let's take note on that right now. John, you are not the only person to have witnessed that. Scientists have witnessed that exact same thing. If I believe there's four, three or four scientists side by side that watched similar. This has happened. And for whatever reason, the majority of the so-called Bigfoot Sasquatch community doesn't have the balls to acknowledge it or share it with you. Isn't that damaging for the people who have witnessed this? That's absolutely damaging. Withholding the truth and the facts when you're putting on this facade of trying to look for the truth and the facts. I'll stop. I've heard a howl in the middle of the day and slapped the back corner of my cabin hard thrown rocks at me, left a footprint, and often steps on my back porch when we're in bed. It really wants to get my attention and has been successful at that. This next big encounter was daytime. I was walking my property looking for arrowheads and I heard a loud snort from about 50 feet away to my right. It didn't scare me. It just shocked me because it sounded like a horse snoring. We don't have horses and what few neighbors I have don't either. I know every person or property around this lake and the nearest horse is over a mile away. A few seconds after the snort, I heard something big walk towards me. It seemed bipedal, but I couldn't bet the farm on it. However, it walked up to within 20 feet of me and stopped. The grass was two feet tall, and I didn't see any grass move, which troubled me as much as the snort and sound of footsteps. As I stood there, I was confused and disoriented. I was probably stuck between fight and flight. I'm not sure how long I stood there, but eventually I walked away. A couple months later, I was walking to my shop, and just five feet away was the same very loud snort. I stopped in my tracks, staring at the area on my right, and I couldn't see anything. This one really scared the crap out of me because it was so close. It seemed like it was either a Bigfoot or a ghost horse. It was large and invisible. But now it gets really weird. Only my wife knows about my encounter with Sasquatch. My granddaughter came to visit this summer for the weekend. She's only four years old. She was driving her pink battery Jeep in the grass as I sat and watched her. I encouraged her to drive her Jeep out into the tall grass, about 20 feet away from where I was sitting, and she got real quiet and stopped, only looking downward. I asked her what was wrong, and she refused to respond. Her emotional change was dramatic, one second laughing, talking and playing, and then suddenly frozen and quiet. I got concerned and asked her what was wrong for the second time when she said, I don't want to go over there because there are monkeys. I immediately jumped out of my chair, and as I stared towards the grassy area, I asked her where and how many. She quickly looked and said there were three. She also said they were at, they were at the tree line, about 50 feet away. Steve, I looked, and I couldn't see anything, but being a grandpa, I believed her and immediately took her inside. Good move. In a separate room, I quietly explained to my wife what she said. I admit we were troubled about it all night. My grandbaby, however, was as though it never happened. But the next day, all three of us purposely walked outside to the same area without bringing up the topic. As we got there, where her pink jeep was still sitting, she froze in place and her grandma asked her what was wrong. And she matter-of-factly said, 
those big monkeys are back. This time I wanted answers, so I asked how many, assuming three again, but she said a lot of them. I raised my ten fingers and I asked if it was this many, and she agreed. I will say that she would only glance over to look in that direction for a moment and then look down and away to her right because they scared her. In an attempt to convince her that she couldn't be scared, I told her that I was going to walk over to the trees and she instantly said, No, Papa, they will throw you in the trees. I'm the biggest man she's ever seen at six foot seven, 385 pounds. She thought I was invincible until now. We went straight inside and stopped talking about it so she would get overwhelmed and fixated on it like I am. Let me end this all with the obvious question. In all four encounters, I couldn't see anything, nor could my wife. However, our four-year-old granddaughter could see and she knows nothing about Bigfoot. The subject has never been brought up around her and she doesn't watch TV. So I ask your viewers, how could she see them and I couldn't? Keep up your good efforts to help us stay in reality, Big John. Yeah, that's pretty alarming, isn't it? That's quite... That's quite the uh, experiences. It's kind of, that I can see that would cause quite a bit of anxiety and uh, worry. When you think about it, you get your four-year-old little precious granddaughter sitting there in the grass and there's something out there that you can't see and she's seen it clearly and it's scaring the shit out of her. But you, you're not the only person to have noted this. You're not the only one. And uh, like I said, if any of you think that a simple trail camera from Walmart is going to do anything when it comes to this topic, think again. There's a lot more going on out there than we know or we can even wrap our heads around. Look at the, even the most intelligent and tenacious of human beings that are pursuing this topic. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to do, so what do they do? They mimic everybody else. They bang on trees and set up trail cameras and hang baits <laughs> or do a gifting area. But the reality is, no one knows what to do. And if they do know, they haven't come forward yet, have they? There's a few people out there who are doing some amazing things, for certain. It's an amazing topic. I, don't, I mean, I am, not, I am not a Bigfoot Sasquatch researcher. I've, I've said it numerous times. Uh... I'm not obsessed with them. There isn't pictures of Bigfoot all over my house or figurines. I'm not into it. But I am into this real world. I am into being absolutely free to do what I want and experience as much as I can before the short ride's over. But during that ride, I don't think it's fair. And I don't think any human being on the planet qualifies to know more than I do. Or know more than you do. And that's the frustrating part. I'm like, F you, man. Uh-uh. I don't give a shit who you are, what you have. You're just another human being and taking your ride on this planet, just like us. And we all deserve equal, fair crack at learning and knowing as much as we can during this lifetime and making decisions based on our knowledge. Right? And that's what I'm frustrated about. But again, John, thanks for that email. Thank you for the photograph share. Um, what do you say? What do you say about that photo? What do you say about that face? That's no monkey. Ain't no monkey. <clears throat> well, you know, almost, I'm almost wondering Maybe you guys can let me know in the comment section below, and I'll, I'll read them. I'll try to read a bunch. It's almost, I'm almost wondering if uh, stacking up people's experiences in one video is possibly doing a disservice to them, maybe. You know, like when I shared Edgar's email, uh, I just shared his email, and that was it. I didn't want... Uh, it was the first time I ever came to that thought of thinking that there shouldn't be any other thoughts here to lose... Edgar's story right away. It's just a thought. You guys let me know because I've been, uh, it's almost in a way I've been trying to get as many as I can out because there's so many, there's so many people waiting to be heard. And then, uh, and I think that we're possibly not giving each person the attention they deserve, maybe. Anyways, let me know what you think. 
obviously it would make it would make for more I don't know if it would make for more work or less work I don't know but um, I don't know I just want everybody to be heard I want everybody to share what they got to share and I want everybody to be equally heard and equally important and I don't want somebody's experience read and then boom it's kicked off to the side and we go on to the next one it's like flipping the pages in a book but these are people these are people with real alarming things going on in their lives well let me read i'll keep going right now and we'll see we'll, what we possibly will do to accommodate better after we hear some comments from the people hello steve i've been following your post for several years now you have no idea how much has it helped it has helped me out i've written to you before and passed on a short story about a photograph and meetings I had with the late Dr. Bendernagel. Wish I had met up with John years ago. He was a good man. Steve, I'm an island man. I grew up in Victoria, and like you, I was into slingshots, bows, and air rifles from the time I was eight years old. Thanks to my late father, who moved the family from the prairies to the island in 1947, I, like you, got to enjoy a bit of paradise. My father, like your grandfather, fought in World War II. He signed up with the SSR, South Saskatchewan Regiment two months before his 18th birthday. Dad would never talk about the war, and the only time I remember seeing my father cry was the day he handed me an eight-track video he had ordered called The Beaches of Normandy. I plugged that video in, and it no sooner started when I turned to see tears in my dad's eyes, and he turned and walked out of the room. P.S. He did tell me the boys referred to the SSR as shoot, shit, and run. War sucks. When I was around 12 years old, old i pleaded with dad to take me fishing so we started out by renting a boat from oak bay marina that started a lifetime love of fishing for both of us when i pleaded to go hunting dad stepped up and every sunday morning at 5 a.m he would take me into the woods i soon realized dad was not thrilled to be back around guns again but he understood my passion steve i hunted and fished pretty near every spot you could find from humpback road to soup to leech town to couch and lake and beyond when i was 17 I should have drowned in the San Juan River when I was swept off my feet and into the large log brush pile, but that's another story. No way. You know what? I flipped over in a canoe on the San Juan River and got smashed into a log jam and lost my rifle. About this time of year, too. Steelhead fishing and going after spring bears. And it was too late. We already dropped off at that. We already dropped off way, dropped off way up river on that one last that bridge. And that's where we got put in in a canoe. And then, uh, we were punks. Dummies. <laughs> and then we had to go all the way out to Fairy Lake, soaked from head to toe in freezing cold temperatures. I No, we stopped and made a fire once when it got a little out of hand. But that's a coincidence, isn't it? <clears throat> the thing is, Steve, I'm soon to hit my 75th birthday, and I've spent countless hours in the backcountry. I've hunted moose, elk, and deer all over BC. I faced a grizzly who wanted my moose, and I've shot a large black bear from the hip as it came at me over a rock face. I can still feel it brush my leg as it passed and then dropped 40 feet away. Steve, here's the thing. I have no fear in the woods, never have. My idea of feeling close to God comes when I'm standing in the timber and alone. Ditto. My wife and I still head into the backcountry in our small motorhome, preferring the remote lakes in the Nimkish Valley and to any public parks. Here's where you and your readers have helped me cope with a never-ending question that is has me awake and up before daylight pretty much every morning. I know about Sasquatch. Here's a quick rundown of my experiences. Number one, when I was 15 and hunting in the souk, I came across a game trail at first light and laying in the middle of the trail was a fresh human-like turd, 14 to 15 inches long and two inches in diameter and brown in color. I thought it was another hunter who just messed up my hunt and he never even wiped his butt. I think different now. Number two, I got to view a clear Polaroid picture back in 1976. It clearly showed a tall Sasquatch walking through some aspen trees on a sunny day. The picture was so clear I could see dark patch under its right arm that I'm sure was sweat. The hair was not long, and in fact, I compared it in length to a color and color to a deer. I estimated the height to be around seven feet using trees as a guide. It also looked to be, in my opinion, around the late teens and human years. There you go again human right you guys who looks at a monkey and guesses it's a teenager i came close to arranging a meeting with john bendernagel and the owner of that picture but john passed and norm the owner of it passed three weeks after john so not to be that's unfortunate 
And you know what? I met up with John years ago too, Victoria. And he, uh, well, I went to a thing at UVic with him, and then he uh, took me to Denny's on Douglas Street and bought me breakfast the next day. We had a good talk. He's a real nice, great guy. I've had other experiences, but what drives me nuts is my reaction to what happened in 2018. I was, it was early April, and my wife and I were heading for Oceano, Oceano Lake up in Strathcona Park. We were accessing the park from above Great Central Lake and up the Ash Main. I made it well into the park, but got stopped by a large snowpack that still blocked the road. I was dressed in casual clothes, but hiked up the hill anyways, looking for tracks of deer or whatever. What I found were eight pristine footprints crossing the road. The snow was half ice and half snow, so it packed tight. The prints were so clear, I could make out what looked like a two-inch gauge in its right hand. Prints were so clear, I could make out what looked like a two-inch gouge in its right heel, and it showed in four tracks. The detail in those tracks was astonishingly clear, and I cursed myself for not having casting material, as I believed those would have been some of the clearest tracks on record. Steve, it really bothers me and inspired me to write this long, rambling letter as this. I studied these tracks, and three times I walked back to my truck and tried to get my wife to come and look at them. She would not. I looked at those in wonder, trying to turn them into fakes, but just not possible for a man to fake those. They were too clear and large and too deep in the snow, as well as too far apart for any man I've ever met. Also, ours were the only vehicle tracks on the road. What I can't explain is the mind games that were just totally out of character for me. I talked myself out of taking pictures. I told myself they would not turn out as set in snow, and I convinced myself no one would believe me anyway, so I walked away. Instead of parking for the night, we drove back to Elsie Lake and spent three days looking at other campers' leftover trash. Steve, it eats my brain. I just can't get my head around walking away from one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. It was like I had brain fog and totally out of character. Same for my wife. Not to want to leave the truck. I just can't explain it. Those tracks were fresh, very fresh, and headed towards the Ash River that was maybe 30 yards away. This letter is way too long and I may not even send it, but here's a footnote. I know a family whose name is known worldwide, so I won't mention it. I have a great respect for these folks, so I was reluctant to tell them the story. I should not have been, I should not have been, for as it turns out, the wife of my friend swears she saw a Sasquatch in a slash three weeks after my experience and swears it was not a bear. Same area. One last thing. I have the image of that Polaroid picture from the 70s burned into my brain to this day. I really wanted John to see that photo, as he told me he thought it to be Gigantopithecus, an ape. My response was, no, it looked too human. I think that disappointed him. I've always found a picture on the web, a sketch. I have since found a picture on the web, a sketch, that is as close as it gets, and if John was still around, I would drive to Courtney to say, John, this is what at least one of them looks like. Since spotting those tracks, we have had several other experiences. Number one, we were camped at a small lake on February 26, my wife's birthday. She got up from the fire, walked over towards me, and with a big smile says, I'm going to call a Sasquatch. It might have been the two glasses of wine. While well, she let out a whoop, and immediately out of the timber, 50 yards away, came a response you could feel in your chest. The look on her face was priceless. I grabbed my camera and took off into the timber, but saw nothing. In April 2020, we camped at a larger lake that was joined to, to, to the small lake by a short river. We had a First Nations man who was researching the area approach our camp and ask me not to go down to the river as there were Sasquatch in the area, and if I did see them, not to throw rocks or bother them and just leave the area. That's actually not a hard request to fulfill, right? Like I can't imagine knee-jerking to throw a rock at a Sasquatch <laughs> myself. The next day, my wife and I walked up the road a short distance, and she waited while I went to check a trail cam I set up at the lake in hopes of catching a cow and calf elk that was tracking up the area. I was gone maybe 10 minutes, and on returning, found my wife was halfway back to the camper. She was a bit shaken and explained she left. She felt stomach sick from what she thought was a dead animal rotting in the bush. Actually, she described it as smelling like rotting meat and strong B.O. Bush was thick, but the smell was gone and no sign of anything, and I searched the area well. 
Steve, I envy your time in the high timber. Thank you so much for your work. If you've ever fished Nuka Sound or being a Critter Cove, it's worth the trip. I actually got it up there. It's beautiful. You do what you do with this letter. I'm long past worrying what others think, and like my father taught me, don't lie to people, and if you shake a man's hand, you stick to your word. Best regards, Ken Salmon. If you're ever in Parksville, I've said on talk hunting stories. <laughs> okay, Ken, I just might take you up on that one day. And uh, thank you so much for sending in that. those experiences. appreciate it, especially because it's right from my home backyard. And on a side note, the San Juan River, you know, that's from my grandfather. We ran into his, that, his experience was above the San Juan River, Fleet Creek or Floodwood Creek, one or the other. And uh, I had friends of mine, fishing guys out of Port Renfrew, text me summer before last that a friend of theirs had just seen one run across the road in front of my Gordon River. Uh, Harris Creek, another guy saw one there. It's endless. And my uncle, I remember t my uncle told me that Gordon River area has one of the most dense uh, areas of uh, spelunking caves in the world, co coincidentally. But there's definitely no shortage of sightings on the island. No shortage. And it's unfortunate Dr. John Vandernagel passed away before discovering the missing pieces to his puzzle when it came to these unknown beings, right? It's amazing how many people, there's a, there's a, a bunch of the old school people where they didn't want to, they didn't want these things to be anything other than an uh, unacknowledged primate, right? Monkey or gorilla, Gigantopithecus. They just didn't want to hear anything different. It doesn't mean anything bad about the character. It's just, it's amazing to watch people I, I, I'm always amazed at how people react differently to the same things. Watching people for me is quite interesting. It's, it's people, it's funny how diverse the reactions are amongst the people when it comes to this topic and how they react and how so many people do not want it to be something other than what they want it to be. And they will, they will go on that ride all the way to the end, even though it goes to nowhere. It's kind of amazing to watch, but like I said before, we all have our own puzzle to complete, and you just have to take from all these experiences what you need for your puzzle. And if there's nothing there for you, well, pass it on by. Don't get angry about it. But anyway, again, if you have if you have something you want to share that you feel may help us or uh, more importantly, may help yourself, then you can email it to share my story how to hunt.com or tell my story how to hunt.com and we'll get to it. We'll eventually get got to. All right. And again, um, probably, I give it, I'd imagine within the next four months, we'll have the, we're going to have something completed and it's going to be a very, very cool place. And it's going to be dedicated to every single one of you people out there to, uh, to have a safe place to talk and share openly, not controlled. And, uh, and I'm going to have a conversation with as many of you people as I can. And uh, I got zero interest in celebrities or people that want subscriber numbers. <laughs> zero. It's all about the people. I'm into the people. All right. So that's the plan. That's what we're going to do. So I got to get going. I got stuff to do. And I got a couple of very important videos to get put together to share with all of you.